Um, okay, I'm very happy to um, introduce our next speaker who is ranked uh, among the top 20 futurists worldwide. He's an American entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and author, and he is the founder and CEO of the early stage science and technology incubator, Magical, a science and technology venture studio based in Los Angeles. And it's to fund and incubate breakthrough companies. He is also the co-founder and chairman of the Arch Mission Foundation, and he is here today to tell us about building a solar system scale archive of all human knowledge that will last up to 14 billion years. Please welcome Nova Spivak. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. So who here knows about Elon Musk's Tesla orbiting the sun? Good. Who here knows that inside of that there was a tiny little disk containing the Isaac Asimov Foundation trilogy made of quartz crystal that lasts 14 billion years? Good. Okay. Who here knows that Space AL crashed on the moon recently? Okay. I would think more of you would know that Space AL crashed on the moon recently, but they did in, in April. So we're going to talk about some of this stuff. Um, this is a crazy side project that has taken over my life um, and has become a sort of obsession for me and, and many other people who are involved. It began actually uh, when I was about eight years old. I had this dream, believe it or not, um, in which I saw a future time where there'd be an environmental crisis and those of us at that time were involved in science and technology decided it was our responsibility to, to back up all human knowledge so it could be passed down through this period of crisis. So I kind of forgot about that dream and uh, then did my career in a bunch of tech companies, got involved in space, actually flew to the edge of space in 99. Um, and uh, eventually this idea came back to me. Hmm. Could we somehow back up all human knowledge? And I didn't make the connection to that dream for a while. Later I did, but as I started thinking about it more and more, I realized, well, why don't we start with the Wikipedia? Because so many people participate in it. It'd be a nice way to kind of send them all uh, to the moon, for example. Why don't we put the Wikipedia on the moon? So many years ago, um, we, uh, maybe 10 years ago, I uh, started looking for uh, technologies that could do that. Um, and that's when I discovered that there are really no forms of storage that we have today that um, could actually preserve something on the moon for very long because um, of the harshness of that environment, temperature, radiation, you know, dust. Um, in fact, our civilization's technologies are surprisingly ephemeral. So that led me on a search uh, for storage technologies, first and foremost, that could preserve information for a very long time. Um, and then from there, this project started to develop. So I'll tell you about what we're doing and, and how we got to where we are and where we're going. So what do these pictures all have in common? The civilizations that made them are gone. We don't know much about some of them. The average lifespan of a civilization turns out to be about 336 years, according to one recent study uh, by the BBC. And why, sh why do we think we are going to be so much better? Why do we think we are different? In fact, if we look at our civilization and our technology, it's way more ephemeral than the technologies for storing information of some of these ancient civilizations. They were using stone and metal. We're using plastic. You know, our DVDs uh, oxidize and pit you know, in a 10-year time frame. Microfiche, if it's not maintained in HVAC uh, and kept away from fire and water, lasts uh, at best it's certified for 50 years. It maybe could last for 100. Paper, well, we know that's going to dissolve. Digital tape, forget it. So what do we got? So the ARC, we call ARC as an archive. The ARC, you can call it ARCH too, because that's nice. But the ARC Mission Foundation is a nonprofit, 501c3 charity, that is building a backup strategy for planet Earth. We're building what we call the Billion Year Archive, which is a backup strategy to pass down the heritage of our planet on an ongoing basis in a manner uh, where we can guarantee for the first time ever that it will never be lost. And how do we do that? How do we make that guarantee? By putting backup sites, backup locations, all over the solar system, the more the merrier, in, in interesting places, in long durability places, as well as on Earth. Um, and you know, that's why it was 
we thought it would be great to put one in the glove compartment of Elon Musk's Tesla because it's probably the weirdest thing in the solar system at this point. You know, somebody's going to look at that someday. So when we think about our backup strategy, we have certain criteria. Uh, first of all, we want to be comprehensive. So we curate the curators. We go find entire libraries or huge data sets that other curators have curated, and we put them into this library. I'm not sitting there choosing this should be in and this should not be in. I'm choosing the best curators who have already done that on a large scale. Um, we want it to be durable for up to billions of years. To do that, we have to use a choice of locations as well as uh, storage technology. We'll get into that. It has to be redundant so that if some of those locations are completely destroyed or lost, there's still other copies. It has to be easy to discover, which means it has to be in places that people are going to look. It has to be easy to recover. Well, if they're all over the solar system, that's not necessarily easy. That's why we want to put them also on the surfaces of planets where there might be intelligent life in the distant future. Easy to understand. Big challenge. Um, you know, we can preserve all of this knowledge, but to make this knowledge something that a future audience in 500 million years is going to make, be able to make sense of, uh, we, we have to do some special things to, that we wouldn't normally have to do if we were designing for people today. We have to make some uh, assumptions as well. We can't design for all possible audiences. I mean, if it's a, if it's a microscopic form of life, um, they might view our storage media as you know, terrain, not storage media. It might be mountains to them. If it's a gigantic form of life you know, that eats planets, it won't even notice it. Um, if it's a metallic digesting form of life, it might find these things as, as tasty treats. So how, how do we design something for all these possible cases? Well, we, we made some uh, design decisions. Um, we're designing for life that, um, that evolves in this solar system. Um, therefore, uh, we, can, we can make a reasonably safe assumption that it's going to be organic and it's going to be based on DNA, and it's probably going to exist if it, if, it, if it evolves on Earth or Mars. Uh, it'll probably be about as tall as us and live in the kind of scale that we live in. It will probably have eyes and be able to see stuff. And because of those, just those assumptions, that we can constrain what we're making. But to make it understandable, we have to give them a basis. We can give them all this data about languages and history and statistics and every concept, but if they can't connect those to some sensory data that we share, they won't know what that means. This is the problem of qualia in AI. And so we constructed a primer, a visual primer, that teaches a million concepts with pictures and words. Um, so that, the, assuming they have eyes, they can see this, see this thing that is labeled tree in five languages, which from there connects to 5,000 languages. So we teach concepts with pictures, at least using vision as a common basis to communicate qualia. We also have to prevent some future civilization from hoarding or suppressing the knowledge. So to do that, every arc that we make contains a map to some but not all of the other arc locations. And there are some locations that aren't on any maps. Just to ensure that there will always be some that some despot uh, won't be able to find and destroy. So each arc contains a backup of planet Earth. The top layers can be seen with a microscope. No computer is necessary. And, and we did that so that future recipients who may or may not have a technology like ours don't have to replicate our entire computer industry just to read the thing. So we found a technology um, which we call nanofiche. And what we do is we etch into nickel um, using a lithography, it's a nanolithography process. So first it's, we etch into glass with a laser, then we grow the nickel with, with an electro-forming process, uh, electro-deposit, we grow nickel on the glass atom by atom, and then we peel it off. So we make nickel films that are etched with analog images. These analog images can be seen under a microscope. And the type of microscope needed we had in the early 1700s. It's a pretty low power microscope. The images are equivalent to 300 DPI images. So it's like a laser printer in nickel at nanoscale. So just to give you a, a sense of how small these are, uh, I'll show you a little bit more. So zooming in to part of the lunar library, which crashed on the moon, and each of those squares is a, is a page now from the primer. And these are pages teaching concepts and ideas. Uh, and this is a little bit closer. And if you can look in here, um, we can keep zooming in all the way down to an individual letter 
every letter is perfect. Every letter is uh, the size of a bacillus bacterium. Um, letters have uh, one micron size features or smaller in them. So uh, we can fit in, a, in just this little region here about 2,000 pages um, of black and white monochrome bitmapped images at 300 dpi equivalent. There are actually um, 40 billion pixels per surface. Um, so it's, it's uh, and we write, we actually etch at 300,000 dpi. So that's the top layers. That's what we call the primer. The top four layers teach about a million concepts with 60,000 images. And what we did is we took every visual dictionary, every visual encyclopedia ever made that, that we could find, and we, we etched them all into that to teach all these concepts in different fields. Then we also etched in languages for 1,000 languages in the top layers, 5,000 layer languages below. Um, and, and many other data sets and uh, useful things, the SETI, all the SETI information, uh, information about our other missions, the history of space flight, uh, and many other things that we wanted people to be able to get uh, with analog images at the top. We also teach how to build a computer and how to understand the deeper encodings, because after the first four layers, we include a lot of other stuff. Um, so we include information. We include the, ge the human genome. We include actual DNA of, of 25 humans of different haploid groups, uh, as well as uh, some, some tardigrades. You may have heard about that. Um, <laughs> we'll get into the tardigrades layer later. That was fun and, and uh, controversial. This is uh, actually synthetic DNA in which we now can at, uh, store data. And this will be a technology we use in our future missions. Here, um, we can store um, a petabyte in a, in, in, a, in a droplet that's too small to see. Uh, we can store um, all of Amazon or Google's data in an amount of space the size of a sugar cube. Um, and it's very durable as long as it's preserved, well protected. Uh, DNA lasts for you know, up to millions of years as long as it's not overheated or subject to radiation. Well, of course, space is exactly the wrong place. However, the solution is redundancy. You can make a huge exabyte or zettabyte data set this way, and you can copy it cheaply. You can make t a trillion copies very cheaply. And so what you do is just make a lot of copies and you spread them out over a wide surface area. As long as you shield it from heat, we can deal with cosmic rays because we know you know, there's a chance that it'll get hit by a high energy cosmic ray, but if you have enough of it spread out over a wide enough area, we can, we can estimate, because there's a lot of redundancy in error correction, we can estimate that it will last for a certain amount of time before every, every piece of every molecule is destroyed. And so that's how we can store da data in DNA for a very long time. And what's interesting about using DNA as a storage mechanism is it's nature's data format. So if we're designing for you know, recipients in 500 million years or 3 billion years, um, you know, we know that we think, let's say we assume, they will probably be DNA-based. They'll probably know more about DNA than they do about the DVD encoding standard that we use today. <laughs> However, um, we also include DVD data. So there's 25 layers in the lunar library. The first four are analog. The next 21 layers are digital, and those are in DVD format, but we teach you how to read them, how to encode them. All the standards documents, everything you need to know to build a computer and understand all this stuff is in the analog layer in the primer. So we, it's a staircase of knowledge. We teach you, as you go down the staircase, how to get the next layer. So analog, digital, DNA. Those are the three big layers of the staircase. Now, uh, by doing this and by putting these in enough places, Eventually, we can make a statistical argument that this heritage will never be lost because it's just not likely that all these locations are going to be destroyed. Uh, and so we can say it will probably last as long as the solar system. I mean, if the sun goes nova, then it may destroy them unless we can get them out of the solar system. So far, we've sent four missions to space. We have others in development. Um, so as many of you know, um, we managed to convince Elon Musk to take a quartz crystal disk that we etched the 900 pages of the, of the Asimov Foundation into. And that's orbiting the sun for 30 million years, at least. Uh, we crashed the lunar library, this 25-layer disk. Um, by the way, that was 25 layers. Each layer um, weighed four grams and was um, 40 microns thick. The entire stack is one millimeter thick and weighs 100 grams. Um, and it contains you know, 60,000 analog images plus almost 200 gigabytes of compressed digital data, plus, and then DNA. 
Um, that's crashed on the moon. We do not believe it was destroyed. Our analysis of the bare sheet crash um, suggests that it didn't generate enough heat uh, to have melted this, it's a very high melting point for nickel. Um, this, the, the payload itself was very strong, stronger than a black box, actually. No moving parts, no electronics. Um, and the way it was attached to the spacecraft was with Kapton tape on the perimeter of the craft. So we believe the craft hit an eight degree angle, blew up into millions of little pieces. This thing was probably ejected uh, downrange and is sitting you know, on the sandy slope of some lunar mountain for the next many billion years. Hopefully it gets covered, um, not hit by too many micrometeorites. This is what the top of the lunar library looks like here. It was being inserted into their sheet. Uh, we have other projects. Um, so uh, the LEO library is a constellation. Um, we launched the first instance of it with Space Chain in 2018. It put the Wikipedia uh, in orbit on a, on a CubeSat. Um, with Astrobotic, uh, in 2021, we'll land the Lunar Library 2.0. Um, and, and this time, we're not going to put any tardigrades in there. Um, it's going to be completely by the book, absolutely no fun whatsoever. We're going to be very serious and have no fun, but we're going to, we're going to do it bigger, and we're going to do it better, uh, and, and we're not going to crash this time. Um, we also have other missions. Um, so uh, Space Belt it will be adding to the, lunar, uh, to the LEO library in the future uh, with secure storage locations um, permanently in LEO. They'll just keep sending them. Um, PT Scientists is uh, working still to uh, also do a number of lunar missions. So the moon, we think, is a great symbol and a great place to put this. Any advanced civilization that evolves on Earth will eventually go to the moon or look at the moon. But the Earth Library, the Eden Project, is to put these in deep caves around the planet and then in deep oceans and on mountains, in places that are geologically interesting and that are long-lasting, where beings who eventually live here or evolve here or visit um, would likely look. Um, but also are inaccessible to beings today, so they're less likely to be looted. Um, we did a send and return for the Conrad Challenge with, um, with Blue Origin. That was interesting for students. Um, Mars, of course, is on the agenda, first to orbit it and ultimately on the surface. Um, I'm particularly fond of uh, the Lagrange uh, concept of putting these in uh, L4 or L5. Um, and there's actually a great scientific reason to do that as well. Um, we think that these, these locations would, would have collected um, quite a bit of very interesting dust um, and could be treasure troves to study the actual um, history of biology and p possible panspermia, or at least in solar system-wide panspermia. We think that we'll, f we'll probably see evidence of tardigrades and other things from Earth sitting in these Lagrange points, and maybe from Mars. So it's a great place to look. Anybody who's worried about uh, planetary protection and contamination, they should be thinking, actually, just go to these places and see what's there. Those are the storehouses where you can find all that history if you really want it. Well, anyway, we'd like to put um, a library uh, into these points, into, into these uh, L4 and L5 points, because that's a great place. People will look there, and it stays there for a really long time. Um, so where are we now? Where is the Lunar Library? The Lunar Library um, is somewhere uh, within 100 kilometers of the Bear Sheet crash site. It's not a crash, by the way. It's a treasure hunt. Uh, and and, um, and uh, actually, according to the LRO, they found the site. We analyzed all the data with a team of scientists to, to figure out uh, the likelihood that we survive, we think it's high, um, but we're somewhere up there uh, at the sort of uh, northeast corner of uh, Mare Serenitatis. So in summary, um, we've either installed the first library on the moon, or we've installed the first archaeological ruins of early human attempts to build a library on the moon. So it's a success. And we need your help. We're funded by donations. Um, we've, had, we've been fortunate to have some, some big donors, but we need more. Um, you know, we're, always running on a shoestring to do this. Um, I do think creating the longest lasting thing that humanity will ever make is a valuable endeavor, not only for beings that, who may or may not exist millions of years in the future, but for people today, because we are bringing about interdisciplinary conversations that would never happen any other way. We're bringing poets together with rocket scientists, together with biologists, historians, linguists. These are people that don't usually all talk together about moon missions. We are we are fulfilling the dream of making humanity a spacefaring civilization by putting the civilization into the spacefaring. That's our job. And we're also providing a means for everybody to participate. We just uh, 
uh, around us, many spin-outs are coming out. Um, one that's formed around us is called LifeShip. They will send you a DNA collection kit. You can put your DNA in it. They will give it to us, and we will put it inside of our next mission. So we will take your DNA to the moon and, and to other places. And yeah, we will make sure that uh, the Planetary Protection Police uh, know about this and are happy about it. Um, but I will tell you something. You know, I, I, I make no bones about it. I'm not a huge fan of planetary protection. Um, I think it's a beautiful idea. It's, it's a beautiful idea. It's a beautiful, completely impractical, idealistic, bullshit, foolish idea. <laughs> but it's beautiful, right? And the, the problem is, it failed before it ever started. We already know there are tardigrades on the moon. Any time a tectite is pick, kicked up from Earth, a, a meteor impact on Earth, it's contaminating the moon with our biology. They found plankton on the outside of the ISS. There's even sketchy but possible evidence there was mold or fungus growing on the Viking. Anytime a spacecraft is launched out of our atmosphere, it's contaminated just by being in our atmosphere. There is no way you can prevent microorganisms from getting onto a spacecraft or into a spacecraft when it's being built and put on a launch pad when astronauts are going in and out of airlocks. It happens. I know a lot of astronauts. There's a huge amount of contraband in space. <laughs> Let's just say, you know, humans take humanity with them, including their microorganisms, their distilleries, their wedding rings, their photos, their Bibles, all kinds of stuff. That's, that's what humans do. If we want to have a human space program, not a robot space program, we have to accept that humans do what humans do. And they like to have their humanity around and their things with them. And they're going to do it. You can make whatever rules you want. They're still going to do it. So why, why is planetary protection so kind of useless? Well, first of all, we know that these various places are being contaminated by each other. It's very likely Earth has contaminated Mars, Mars has contaminated Earth, they both contaminated each other's moons. It's an ongoing process. Because rocks fly around the solar system, it happens. And you know, big, big impacts spread debris all over the place. Maybe panspermia is also to blame. Maybe we've got tardigrades on comets coming to us from other solar systems. We'll find out. But the bottom line is, the argument that, uh, sci that space should be a giant laboratory completely sterilized and owned by a couple scientists is just fallacious. What is space? First of all, space is really big. Second of all, Earth contaminated space a long time ago. So, you know, I look at Mars and these places as there for us. Those places are there for us. And if humanity, or life on Earth in fact, is going to survive, it must get out of this ecological niche. So, planetary protection is actually anti-nature. It's against evolution. It's protecting some microorganisms that may or may not be there. Meanwhile, we're risking our own planet and our own survival, which must spread, must have redundancy, um, or we will absolutely, definitely be extinct within 100 million years. Absolutely. So therefore, you know, I love the idea of planetary protection, but I think there's another way to achieve it. And that is, scientists can send hermetically sealed bubbles to planets and leave them there, capture some atmosphere, leave that bubble there, or bring it back and they can get their sample, but they better do it soon because as soon as humans start going there, you know, that's it, the game's up. Um, I think Lagrange points are a better place to look um, and that solves the problem because if there was any life on Mars, there's gonna be little bits of it in you know, L4, L5. Um, furthermore, you can analyze the DNA of anything you find and you can look at where it is on the tree of life and determine if it emerged from our tree of life or a different tree of life. So the whole argument that somehow we're going to put something on Mars and then not be able to determine if it came from Earth, that's just not true. That's not true. You can sequence the DNA and you can figure out its heritage. So there are a lot of problems. Now, the one big argument in planetary protection that, okay, does hold water is introducing invasive species and destroying an ecosystem in another planet. I'm sorry, that's just what life does. It's survival of the fittest. It's survival of the fittest. And in fact, that might actually make a more fit species from the combination and competition of the species now that are competing. That's just what life does. It does it all the time. And if we try to stop it, we're using nature, but we're actually being anti-nature. So I'm in favor of nature. I'm in favor of evolution. And, and the imperative of evolution is to spread and to get out of our ecological niche. That's our responsibility. So I think about it as, from a planetary preservation perspective, we must back up our planet into places where life can survive. Thanks. I have, uh, one obvious place that people, if, if our civilization fails, might look for, inf for information is, is old libraries. So I'm wondering if you're thinking of putting copies in all of the actual existing libraries, because that seems like a place where people would look. 
I mean, we'd love to if we can afford to make them. These things are expensive to make. Um, they're very exotic. You know, three of the longest lasting things humanity have ever, has ever made are uh, the Voyager disk and then you know, the Elon Asimov disk and the Lunar Library. They're expensive and hard to make, um, but we want to make them and give them away. Um, and yes, we'll do that. And probably DNA will be the best, cheapest way to do that. Hey, so um, kind of a follow-on to that. Have you ever worked with the Long Now Foundation? Who They're partners, and we sent a ton of their content um, on our missions, and, and we'll do so on every other mission. So specifically with their 10,000-year clock, just because in terms of archaeological sites for the far future, yep. that might be somewhere that people would look. Yeah, they're going to definitely, um, I think, include us there, and we're taking everything they're doing everywhere we're going. In our, in our field, you know, the more the merrier. That it, it actually makes us more likely to be successful. So we'll take anything and everything, and we'll give our stuff to anyone and any, you know, and everyone, as long as there's budget. Um, <clears throat> so um, the space isle uh, crash brought up an interesting point. How do you find this, and then how do you know how to use it? Because like, you still need a microscope. Mm. Someone from the 1800s might not like, think it's just someone from the rubbish. 1800s probably won't get to the moon and find it. Um, so we have to assume if they're on the moon, they have microscopes or they can make them. Other locations is a different story. On Earth, we'll put a microscope there with it. But how do you even know it's there? Um, well, there's a little smudge on the moon, and you can see that, but there's, there's another strategy, and we call that the beacon project. So we need to make a beacon that will attract the attention of people or beings in the far future. Um, ultimately, we want to make a passive beacon that you can see, but that also reflects uh, all different uh, wavelengths of energy, um, like a big RFID tag on the moon, um, we'll get there. But as a first step, um, since we couldn't afford to do that, we had to make a beacon that would be passed down or visible in the distant future, and we settled on mythology as our beacon. So we needed to do something that would cause enough of a stir that it would become a legend or a myth and become part of the oral tradition of humanity and passed down as a fairy tale to children, which are the longest lasting things, in, longest lasting messages in, in human history are these little fables and fairy tales. We had to create one. So I'm just gonna let you puzzle on what that was and what we did to achieve that. 